Hello, good morning. My name is Oğuz Kutucu and I'm a professional tourist guide. I'm Turkish and I'm living in Turkey. In this video series, I would like to introduce you the treasures of my country, Turkey, but from the viewpoint of a professional tourist guide. I will start with the most visited classical ancient city of Turkey, Ephesus. I am in Kuşadası now. Kuşadası is a very pleasant and a very favorite holiday resort in Western Turkey. With its cultural and historical values, with its very pleasant Mediterranean climate, every summer those two ports of Kuşadası are visited by hundreds of cruise liners carrying thousands of passengers. and it's a gateway for Ephesus for the cruise liner's passengers. Good morning. I'm on the road for Ephesus early in the morning hours. And I said to you in the very beginning that I will introduce you with Ephesus from the viewpoint of a professional tour guide. Therefore, now is the right time to give you some tips. Well, the tip number one is that Ephesus site has got two entries, the top and the bottom entry. I suggest you to start your tour from the top one and walk down it. It's easier and less tiring. Don't forget. Uh, you will need minimum half one and a half hour to visit Ephesus. My other tip is what time of the day is the best to visit Ephesus? There are two good times. The first one is immediately after it is open, with morning coolness, with morning quietness, you can enjoy it greatly. If you came to Turkey from Kushada support with a cruise liner, meet your guide as early as possible and don't forget there is a 30 minutes drive from Kushada to Ephesus. Another good time of the day is the afternoon hours, when the sun is getting cool, when there are many shades. I enjoy the sight with, uh, without scorching. By the way, there are toilets at the boat entries. There are cafeterias and shopping facilities too. Souvenir shop owners and the local people around Ephesus are very helpful and very kind. You can use your credit cards and most convertible currencies such as Turkish liras, euros, dollars, pounds can be used. By the way, please do not forget one more important point. The ticket kiosk of Ephesus, as well as all the other ticket kiosks in the ancient cities of Turkey, will accept only cash Turkish lira and international credit cards, but no cash foreign currency. So what I suggest you is visit Turkey, visit Ephesus with an official agent and certified tour guide. In this way, they will be prepared for this kind of details and they will take care of this kind of things for you. On the other hand, the nearest international airport is Izmir Airport. The sign of it is ADB, Alpha Delta Bravo. 
if you are in Turkey, just for a few days, such as for business or for seminars or whatever your purpose is, just contact with your agent for a tour, because there are many regular flights from all major cities of the country to Izmir, ADB, and the drive from airport to Ephesus is only an hour on a very pleasant and a very scenic highway. And after a visit, you can return to where you came from. For instance, a Istanbul flight is less than an hour. Don't miss this chance. Now, let's go and visit Ephesus. Okay, now we are in Ephesus. As we enter, uh, just across the modern entrance gate, there are the ruins of a 2nd century AD bath complex. The restorations are still going on, therefore it's not open for public visits. Uh, with some of its bathing roofs hewn into the native rock and a latrina, some shops for a revenue to the bath complex, and some mosaic floors were unearthed. The next is the Odeon building, the meeting place of the members of the city chamber. However, before continuing to the Odeon building, uh, I'd like to show you the model of Ephesus, which is on our left side. It shows the excavations and their places, so I find it always useful to, to see this model before uh, we start our tour. At this point is uh, where we are at the moment. Number four you see here is the ticket kiosk and the entrance gate. Number five is the Agora. Uh, number eight is the bath complex that I have shown you. Uh, I have mentioned a little ago. Number seven is the Odeon building. So this is the upper entrance area. Just behind the upper entrance area, shown with number 12, is the main street. And uh, back there is number 19, is the city center of Ephesus, where the library uh, and the Agora is. You can see the uh, the, the theater clearly as well from this point, number shown with number 21. And in front of the theater, that tiny long street is the Harbor Street. And at the very end of the Harbor Street, in the antique times, nearly 2000 years ago, there was the Aegean Sea. Today, unfortunately, Aegean Sea is not on that very point. It's nearly five kilometers or three miles away from its original point. It's because of the siltation of the river Kaistros. Uh, the car park uh, can be seen just behind the uh, theater. That gray ground shown over there is the uh, car park. Uh, here is the uh, brief list of the excavated areas, fortifications of the city. As is shown here, uh, we will start from upper end and we will continue to the lower end. And after passing the theater and the Harbor Street, we will finish our tour in uh, the uh, lower entrance area where the car park is. So it's always a good idea to start from the upper uh, entrance of the uh, city. Total walking will take you more than an hour. If you include the terrace houses and Mary's church, uh, you should add one and a half hour more to the tour program. So it will take you minimum two, two and a half hours to visit whole Ephesus in a full tour. The archaeologists found obsidian tools and ceramics belonging to late Chalcolithic and early Bronze Ages, 5000s, 4000s, 3000s, 2000s BC. For a clear history of the region, we needed to wait till late Bronze Age, 1500s BC. 
Minoan culture, later Mycenaeans in the Aegean and Greek mainland, and Hittites on the other side of the Aegean at Asia Minor were two major powers of this period. And in between them, on the Aegean coast, little Arzawa kingdom with their famous coastal city, Apasas was a kind of buffer zone. Hittite's horses clearly mention about other cities of the region, like Milavanda and Vilusa. The world today mostly know those cities with their Hellenized names, Milavanda as Miletus, Vilusa as Troy. Also, according to Strabo, a geographer around the time of Christ, other nations living in this region were Carians and Lelegians. After the fall of Arzawa Kingdom and Hittite Empire, in a period of lack of authority and ruling power around the Eastern Aegean, the Dorians, one of the ethnic Greek tribes from north, invaded the southern part of Greece. This was a big clash. Homer, the legendary author of Iliad and Odyssey, called this period as the Greek Dark Age. It was 12th century BC. In this period, a very high amount of Greeks left home across the Aegean Sea, migrated to the Asia Minor, and settled there. And there, together with the locals of Anatolia, Greeks established 12 cities and called themselves as Ionians. And among those 12 Ionian cities, Ephesus was like the most precious diamond on a necklace. In this new Greek colonization and the new urbanization period of Asia, the deep Greek culture has got a deep influence on the locals. Many nations around the Aegean, including already collapsed people of Hittites, Hattis, Arzawas, and the indigenous nations like Carians, Luvians, Lelegians adopted Greek culture, language, lifestyle, art, and later alphabet. For about five centuries, Ephesus remained as an independent city-state until it was conquered by the Lydians, the nation who minted the first money we know. The archaic temple of Artemis was still under construction at that time. Artemis was one of the most revered Olympus deities and was the goddess of hunt, chastity, wilderness, wild animals and moon. The great Lydian king Croesus who is often known as the richest of all kings, made a very large contribution to the construction of the temple. It was so big and beautiful that Antipater of Sidon recorded it as one of the seven wonders of the world. Today, unfortunately, very few of its remains survive. However, the thriving leading period was only a few decades. In the middle of the 6th century BC, Anatolia faced with the Persian attacks from east. Following the defeat of King Croesus of Lydians, Ephesus entered under the rule of Persians. This was a prosperous period too. Ephesus had become an important center for arts, culture, and trade. Two centuries later, after providing unity in Macedonia and in Greece, Alexander the Great passed the Dardanelles and faced with the Persian army. War ended with the victory of Greeks. In 334 BC, Alexander entered Ephesus victoriously. The era we know from our history books, the Hellenistic period, had started. However, after the initial celebrations, he found the Temple of Artemis burned and in ruins. Asked the locals for what happened to it, they replied that the goddess Artemis was very busy for helping Alexander's mother during her delivery, his birth, so that she was not present in Ephesus to protect her temple. A certain madman called Herostratos wanted his name carved in the history, so he had set the temple in fire. Alexander was sad. He wanted to raise a big fund to restore the temple, but the Ephesians refused, as saying, it does not befit a god to construct a temple for a goddess. They took the restoration of the temple to their own, and in return to this, Alexander declared Ephesus tax exempt for long years. After Alexander's unexpected death in Babylon, his huge empire was shared among his four generals, and one of them, Lysimachus, took Ephesus and Asia. After the death of Lysimachus, his right-hand general Philetaros established the kingdom of Pergamon and 
for another nearly two centuries, his five successors ruled not only Ephesus, but an area around the Aegean and Anatolia as large as today's Greece. Only two centuries later, in the 2nd century BC, the rising power was the Romans, and the last king of Pergamon, Attalos III, was a eunuch. He had no hair, worrying about the games of thrones in the future, and this would cause the destruction of his kingdom. Attalos III made a very radical decision and bequeathed his kingdom to Rome. The Roman period was six centuries. Although Ephesians disliked Romans because of very high taxations, and the Romans were more equal than the others, on the other hand, they were happy because of a very highly developed network of the roads, safer trade routes, better living standards, and nicer and safer cities. Emperor Augustus had found Rome of clay and left of marble. Roman Empire of his time had 15 states, the largest two were Africa and Asia. The most important achievement of Ephesus at this period was the adoption of it as the capital of the province of Asia by Augustus. This initiated the most prosperous period of Ephesus. It had been not only a center for cultural commerce, but now it was the capital of the whole province of Asia. I will return to history later, but now I'd like to show you some of the remains of Ephesus. Let's go to the upper gate and start exploring.
Behind me is the temple of Emperor Domitian. Historical sources write that he ruled the Roman Empire in between 81 and 96 AD. There were a lot of persecutions to Christians in his period. When Domitianus was ruling the Roman Empire, they decided to construct a temple for his honor. They chose this area. However, the area was sloping, so the idea came up to construct a base for the temple first, then the temple was built onto it in the direction of the trees. Behind them, there was an eight by 13 column temple of Emperor Domitian there. When the opening day of the temple came, everybody was asked to wear white and bring sacrifices to the temple. There were only two people in whole Ephesus wearing black, but no white and bringing no sacrifices. They were John the Evangelist and his beloved disciple, Prochorus. They were immediately arrested. They were transferred to Rome because Emperor wanted to see them in person. Emperor talked them in person. Everybody was expecting crucifixion for them. But surprisingly, Emperor sent them to a penal colony of the Roman Empire in the Aegean Sea, a little island, seven by three miles. We know it as Pamus. They were there for 16 months. 16 months later, Emperor Domitianus died. Nerva came and their exile is terminated. Then they have been back to Ephesus and John the Evangelist had a long life of nearly 100 years and died peacefully in Ephesus at almost the age of 100. Street or Main Avenue was decorated with statues, statues of philosophers, doctors, statesmen, soldiers, merchants, and politicians. The avenue's length was a little more than 200 meters or nearly 700 feet and was paved with all very fine quality local marble. And also, there were the residences of the wealthy people and aristocratic families on both sides of the street, as well as memorials, temples, fountains, and many, many shops in the porticos placed on both sides of the street. The continual flow of strollers, hawkers, barbers shaving their clients in the streets, maybe some snake charmers as well, the rich people carried in litters on the shoulders of slaves. 
They all, I believe, created an incredible scene with a deafening noise on this avenue. In between 98 and 117 AD, Emperor Trajan ruled the Roman Empire. He was the second one of the five good emperors of the empire. In his period, Ephesians constructed this fountain for his honor. It was a two-storied one, 12 meters high or nearly 35 feet high. As you look at the building, to the center of the building, you will see a globe over there, and next to the globe is a human right foot figure. That globe, for many people, is the Earth. Did they know the Earth was a globe? If they knew the Earth was a globe, how did they explain the globe, the sea on it? How come it didn't pour off the sides of the globe? Did they know the gravity as well? This is one of the unsolved mysteries of Ephesus. Walking along the main avenue, from top to bottom end, almost at the midway, there are 12 shops in a shopping arcade. It is called as Aliati's Store. The store was roofed, was nearly 60 meter or nearly 200 feet long, and what they sold here was precious metal goods, glasses and jewelries. Our archaeologists found the best mosaics of Ephesus on the floor of this store. Marble was luxury, but mosaics were exclusivity. In my tours, I often call here as the Rodeo Drive of Ephesus. Hadrian's period is in between 117 and 136 AD. He is Trajan's adoptive son, the third one of the five good emperors of the Roman throne. He graced all corners of the empire with monumental buildings. Although it is called as a temple, indeed it was a little memorial built in homage to Emperor Hadrian. The founder was one of the wealthiest citizens of Ephesus, Medius Antoninus Sabinus, according to its inscription. The monument is definitely one of the highlights of Ephesus in terms of the organization of the ornaments. The crowning bust of Tike, or Fortuna, the goddess of fortune and prosperity, is on the keystone of the Arch of the Pediment. Just behind it is the frieze of Medusa. It is because she can transform anyone who looks into her eyes into stone. She is used as a protective figure here. There is a very interesting speculation about this frieze. As you see, it looks like a half-naked body rather than a regular portrait of Medusa. So, some scholars suspect that it could be Antinous, the Bithynian boy that Emperor Hadrian is deeply in love. After the boy's accidental drowning in Nile River in Egypt, Emperor was in so deep sorrow that he deified his lover 
and erected hundreds of his statues and constructed more than 30 temples in various corners of the Roman world. So, can this phrase be Antinous? I think we will never be able to find it out. Have a look at the marvelous bust of Antinous in Athens National Museum. On the left side, the friezes show Androclos, the legendary founder of Ephesus, pursuing a boar and kill it. It was what the oracle in Delphi told him. A wild boar would have showed him where to establish the new city. So this is mythological found on the story of Ephesus. The next one has Hercules, Nike and Amazons, the female warriors from mythology. On the other side, Amazons, Pan, Dionysius, dancing satyrs and a man riding an elephant. The next is the figures of Dia Roma, Artemis, Apollo, Androclos, Heracles and Dionysius. Toilets, baths and red light areas were where they get socialized. They met with friends and colleagues to talk about business, politics, philosophy here. There were rich decorations on the wall. We know because there are the fragments of it. And the floor as well. This wooden platform is to protect it. And there's an open air pool in the center. A channel for fresh water for rinsing. They had their natural sponges in their hands. They used to wet and rinse themselves with their natural sponges. And there were pipes on the wall as flush toilets. The terrace houses are the residences of the aristocrats and ultra-rich Ephesians. Two blocks or two insulas were restored in 1960s and 2000s. The metal roof looks like a contrast in an ancient city, but it provides an amazing protection. Without it, restorations could not be possible. The roof covers a 4,500 meter square or nearly 50,000 feet square in area and total cost of it is nearly 11 million dollars or nearly 10 million euros. And there are seven residences inside of it. In past 20 years, Almost like a huge jigsaw puzzle, our restorators reassembled nearly 200,000 pieces of terrace house decorative marble floor and wall veneers. This was an amazing work and still not complete. The rich decorations of the residential units with frescoes, murals and staccos, mosaics and marble veneers mirrored the luxurious urban style living of the sophisticated upper class Romans. The blocks are called as insulas. The insulas follow a grid scale plan which cuts each other with right angles. This earliest city plan is called as Hippodamos plan. Every residential unit here has fresh running water, toilets and sewers. And even more interesting is the presence of the underground heating system based on the circulation of hot air in underground spaces in some of the rooms.
Many indoor fountains also honored it. Surely, they were used as not only decorations, but also as ancient air conditioners, benefiting the refreshing effect of the splashing water. According to the results of the latest excavations, these residential units were used from 1st century BC to the devastating earthquake of 367 AD.